and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Repeating verse 25, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. With the help of the Holy Ghost, I'd like to preach on this thought this morning. Melodies at midnight. Melodies at midnight. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. I pray, Lord, once again that you just anoint my mind and my lips to bring forth your words, that your words may flow forth. And that they would fall on good soil, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be prepared to receive the message which you have for us today, Lord. I pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset and one accord, that the Holy Ghost may move through this place as he so chooses, Lord, making himself visible if he would so choose. Lord, just do it in ways we could never dream or imagine, and we give you praise and glory for it in your name. Amen. Melodies at midnight. When we think about melodies, there's something cheerful about a melody, typically. When you think about a melody as a song you sing out of the abundance of your heart, a melody is perhaps that bird at 6 o'clock in the morning that's out on a branch when you're trying to sleep that is just chirping and singing away. That bird has a joyful song in its heart. Melodies are something that we apply to joyfulness, gladness. But midnight is the exact opposite, is the exact extreme. For normally when we think about midnight, it is the pinnacle of darkness. It is that point when things, if they could get any darker, they can't possibly get any darker at midnight. For it is at midnight when things are at the extreme worst. It is darkness, it is doom, it is gloom. And we think about midnight and the Bible. The Bible declares in 11, 4, in verse, uh, 11 verse 4, And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, about midnight will I go into the midst of Egypt. You know, it was about midnight that that blow was not applied to the doorpost that God himself was going to pass through and judgment was going to fall upon all those who did not have the blood of the lamb applied to their doorpost. The Bible states in Exodus chapter 12 and 29, And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land, and the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And we go into the New Testament in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 6 the Bible states, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. You see, there was this parable of the ten virgins that Jesus was telling them about had the oils and they had the, their lamps to go forth waiting for the bridegroom. And we relate to the parable, there are five wives that took more than enough oil than they needed to last through the night. But there were five foolish that said, we only need this much and we don't need any more. But their oil ran out. And about midnight, for those five foolish virgins, they missed out on the bridegroom. They were not allowed to go into the palace. They were not allowed to enter into the feast. Their time had run out. Because of their foolishness, about midnight, those five foolish virgins never saw the bridegroom. They were left out of the wedding. If we relate it to our, to our childhood, there's one woman who had three mean stepsisters who are looked down on her and would tell her to do their, all their chores and, and we would go through our heads and right now you're probably thinking Cinderella, Cinderella, Cinderella. <laughs> and what happened about midnight when that chime struck? Her dream, her fantasy, her gathering, it was gone. Her chance for the prince, everything she dreamed at midnight, it all stopped and she had to take off. Midnight is that time when doom and gloom come. If we apply it to a more real world scenario, the doomsday clock, when that doomsday clock strikes midnight, they say it's the end of the world. Midnight is the darkest time when everything is let loose. That which you couldn't even dream possible, that's when it occurs. All those monsters of the night comes creeping out, so to speak, 
It is the exact opposite of midnight. If we look here at the life of, of Paul and Silas and back up a little bit, we would find that before they even got to the prison, that they were being attacked. They were being attacked by the devil. It, if we go back to Acts chapter 16 and verse 2, the Bible states, and from this to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony where we were in that city abiding certain days. You see, Paul traveled to Philippi. There he met with other believers as we go on throughout the passage here. And we will read in verse 13 where he states, And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted there. You see, Paul and Silas, they went into a different city on their missionary journeys into Philippi, and there they met the Christians by the river. You see, during that time, if there was not an established church building or place to go to, the Christians would meet by the riverside. That's where they would hold church. And if we look at Acts chapter 16, if you would read down through that passage, you would find that Paul and Silas day in and day out would travel with these Christians. They would meet by the riverside for prayer. They would meet by the riverside, I would assume, for singing and joyfulness. They would meet there for perhaps all preaching and teaching. But something happened every single day that they went to the river. In Acts chapter 16, the Bible states down to verse 18. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed by it with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much um, soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us in Christ, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out of her the same hour. You see, here we have Paul and Silas. Day in and day out. They're going to church. So they're going to that riverside. But they're being attacked by the devil every single day. There's this little woman who's demon possessed. It's just a girl. It says by Susan, if we would have put it in today's turn, she was a fortune teller. But every single day, she would meet Paul and Silas saying that these men are the servants of the Most High God. Was she saying something that was false? Absolutely not. For what she was saying was absolutely the truth. But what she was doing was she was mocking them. It wasn't just a recognition. But every single day, as they went to the river to pray, she was making fun of them. She was mocking them. She was laughing at them. That demon that was inside of her was rejoicing and making fun of these men of God. Until one day, the apostle Paul got so grieved in his spirit, and he said, Brother Russ, I've had enough of this through the power of the Holy Ghost. He rebuked that demon and commanded it to come out of her. And the Bible says that it does not state that Paul hung around. Sometimes us as Christians, when we pray for things, we think that, oh, we got to stay there the whole time and pray and pray and pray. Scripture does not say that is the case with the Apostle Paul. But I believe that Paul was so fed up in his spirit with this demon mocking him day in and day out. He was so full of faith and had enough faith and trust in God that said, you know what? I'm going to command the spirit to come out of her. And when it does, it is in God's hand. For it is not by my mind. It is not by my power. But it's by the spirit of the living God. And now it's demon. It doesn't mean even if Paul was not present. Within that hour, that demon left that girl. You see, there are things in our life that sometimes the devil comes in and he tries to battle with us day in and day out. You see, the thing is, this demon battled them before they went to prayer. He, he didn't come up and show his ugly face after they were coming from prayer because there is power in prayer. But the demon attacked them every day as they were going to prayer. You see, there are things in our life that the devil's going to come and try to discourage us with. He's going to try to get us down. And he's not going to come after we just had a great grand session with God of talking and praying. But he's going to come either before or, or when a time has lapsed and we are maybe not expecting him. You know, maybe it's depression, maybe it's hopelessness, maybe it's just the, the deeds of every day, maybe it's financial, maybe it's an emotional, but I can promise you that the devil is going to try to attack you one way or the other. And as I was at 
work on Wednesday as I was just sanitizing the cart. You know how scientific is that? But I felt the Holy Ghost impress on me today that there's going to be somebody in church that they're going to feel sad or they're going to feel down or perhaps hopeless. And But this is the message that is just hanging in there because God has all things under control. It may seem like it's midnight now. It may seem like it's at the worst that it can possibly be. Perhaps it seems like the devil has you down on the ground with his knee on your neck. But I'm here to tell you today that keep hanging in there and realize where your hope comes from. It may seem like hell, uh, it's midnight, but I'm telling you to make sure that you have a cheerful melody in your heart, that you have praises unto God, because it is not going to be just when we're on our knees that we get the victory. We're going to get the victory when we start realizing that God's already got the battle won. We've taken it to him in prayer. We've told him what's going on. Not that he hasn't already known, but now we're going to lift up our hands and say, God, I thank you that you have the situation under control. It may seem like it's helpless. It may, I may feel hopeless, and it may feel like it's help, uh, helpless. I may feel helpless, and the situation may feel hopeless, but I'm going to lift up my voice to you and let you know that I'm going to praise you in the storm. I'm not going to get my eyes off of you as Peter did, but I'm going to reach out and hold your hand and I'm going to walk on the water with you side by side. I will not let the circumstances of life drag me down anymore. Praise God. The next thing I see is as they were going, it wasn't just the devil attacking them, but they were being attacked by man. The Bible declares in Acts chapter 16, 19 through 24, and when her master saw that hope was uh, the, the hope of their game were gone, they caught Paul and saw this and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe by Romans. Uh, and the multitude rose up to get against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Do you realize that when the devil realizes that he cannot attack you internally and he cannot attack you with your mind or your feelings or your emotions, that he's going to start using other people to attack you? When he cannot get to you personally, he's going to start using other people to attack you. Here we find Paul cast out that demon from that girl. And what happened next? Her money-hungry owners, her masters came and realized that she couldn't even tell silver from gold anymore. She couldn't tell you what blue was versus bright yellow was, if we were going to put it in those terms. Her, all her money-making talents were gone. She couldn't tell you your future. She couldn't tell you if you were going to make it to tomorrow. She couldn't tell you what the winning lottery numbers were. All her talents, that demon that possessed her and gave her all the information, he was gone. And along with him, so was her money. So those men attacked Paul and Silas because their fortune was gone. And they dragged him to the magistrates or the rulers of the city. And they started talking against Paul and say, they've done this and they've done that. And you know, they're teaching things that go against our Roman traditions. And since they were taken to Romans, we have no idea how many times that Paul and Silas were being. According to scriptures, we know that the Jews would only beat him 39 times because they knew, they believed that if you beat a man 40 times, it was going to kill him. But Romans were masters of execution. They were masters of death. And they would beat you, and they would beat you, and you would beat you. You realize when the devil can't get to you anymore, he's going to start using other people to get to you. When I was back home, I had a new assistant manager. And she was not a Christian. And for two years, she was constantly on my case. And there came a day when I was just walking by and she yelled out to me, don't be spreading your religion to other people. I hadn't been talking to anybody. There was nobody around me. But I knew long before what was going on. The fact that I was a Christian was bringing conviction upon her. 
She knew what was right and what was wrong. And because of that, I could brush it off. But if I wasn't aware of that, I could take that personally. I could take that personally to my core. And the devil would have used it to get me down, get me down, because I had to face this every single day. I had to go into work for two years. But I had to realize it wasn't her coming against me. She was fighting against God. But the devil sure used her to make my life rough for about two years. You know, when the devil can't get you internally, because our battle field that he loved to play on is our mind. That's his favorite place to dwell on. But if he can't get you there, you'll start using other people to make your life more difficult. And then, after the magistrates beat them, they get placed in charge of a jailer who threw him into, he threw them into the dungeon of the prison. Not their own little cell, but he threw them into the dungeon. And he bound their feet. And he bound their hands. Paul and Silas didn't do anything to this jailer. But he knew he had to cover his butt because if they escaped, he was going to face the same punishment. So he made sure that Paul and Silas were bound. He didn't have nothing against them, but you realize that Paul and Silas could have taken that personally? But they didn't. See, when the devil can't attack us directly, he'll use other people. But we need to make sure that our attention is always fixated on God. At all times. The Bible records Saul's, Pilate's, and Silas, Paul and Silas's response. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prison heard them. Think about it. Put yourself in Paul and Silas's shoes. You've just been going to church. And before you even got there, you get some men come and get you. They drag you off to the rulers. They beat you. They strip you. They cast you into the dungeon in the prison. Your hands are bound. Your feet are bound. And we're, we're not talking about a dungeon today. We're talking old time dungeon. You know, maybe a, a small hole in the floor. They weren't in a hole on the floor. They had a door. But they could have very easily said, you know what? My back's hurt. My feet hurt. My legs hurt. Silas, I can't scratch the itch of my nose. And the list could have went on and on. Can you believe that God is allowing this to happen to us? But they didn't do any of that. The Bible states, at midnight, at what we would classify probably the darkest part of the night. When all hope is gone. When there is not even a chance of seeing a flicker of light. They're singing praises to God. And if we would continue on with this past, we would find that God comes through in a miraculous way. He sends an earthquake. All the doors open up in the prison. Their shackles fall off. Their feet are loose. The jailer gets saved. His whole family gets saved. Not only do they get saved, but they get baptized in water, which shows to the world that, hey, we've, turned, we've put off those old Roman traditions. we put off those old customs. We're following Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All because two men at midnight sang praises to God. As Sister Beth comes to the piano, Perhaps today we can relate to the psalmist David in Psalm 22, 1 through 3. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from my words, from the words of my roar. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, am I, and am I not silent? But thou art holy, O oh, that, O oh, thou, that inhabitest the praises of thy people. Do you realize that God can be far from us? But when we start praising him, he recognizes us. 
and he comes down to dwell with us. The Bible said right here that he inhabits the praises of Israel. I'm here to tell you, he inhabits your praises as well. Sometimes we can get our eyes off of Jesus and we get so wrapped up with our feelings. But you realize that our feelings are fickle? You realize that our feelings are not always accurate. In fact, sometimes they're the farthest thing from accurate. We need to recognize that in those darkest times, we just need to stop and we need to praise God. And we need to join David as he declared in Psalm 119, verse 62. At midnight, catch that, at midnight, I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgment. You know, today maybe you're feeling depressed, maybe you're feeling hopeless, maybe you're just feeling that God's not close right now. I'm telling you, we need to stop everything and just look in our head and say, God, it doesn't matter what I'm going through, but you are holy. God, it doesn't matter what I'm going through, but thank you for salvation. If there's nothing else I can thank you for, I can thank you for salvation. I can thank you that you are a friend that's to get closer than a brother. When it seems like all hope is gone, when it seems like my family's abandoned me, when it seems like my friends abandoned me, when it seems like I'm the only person left in the world, you're right there with me every step of the way. But victory only comes through praise. When we start praising God, that's when everything changes. When we lift up holy hands, that's when the burdens begin to roll off. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in your heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This morning, as we stand across this place, why don't we just lift up our holy hands and say, God, I give you praise and glory, for you alone are holy and alone and worthy. Tonight, I am laying it all at your feet, any sense of hopelessness, any sense of despair, any sense of loneliness. Today, I'm laying it at your feet. Whatever it is this morning, I want to encourage you. Lay it at the feet of Jesus. Make sure that it's there. Tell him what you're going through. But when you're done telling him what you're facing and what you're feeling, praise him. God, I thank you for you're going to bring us through. Thank you that you're always there for me regardless. I thank you that you said in your word you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Therefore, I know your promise.